Hello, welcome to lecture 32 of Electrical Circuits 1. In this lecture, we will complete our discussion of AC power analysis. Now, in this class, we're just doing a very brief overview of AC power. You'll typically take another class, typically during your junior year, which is entirely on AC power. I'm just trying to give you the fundamentals and a brief overview of what's going on in this class. The well, first thing to this lecture, we'll review AC power analysis, the stuff that we talked about last time. Remember that we had a bunch of different terms for the different types of power. Average power, complex power, power triangles, we had power factor. We had RMS values. I'll go over those briefly again today and do another example relative to these kind of things. Next, we want to talk about power factor correction. As I mentioned last time, Reactive power is traded back and forth between the source and the load. It doesn't get dissipated. It doesn't get transformed into useful work. The power factor is telling us roughly how much reactive power we have relative to our real power. What we do generally is if our power factor is too high, if we've got too much reactive power, we will typically try to correct that. The process is called power factor correction. We'll spend the last portion of this lecture on that topic. Related written materials are in 2.9.1 and 2.9.2. Now a quick overview of the AC power topics that we talked about last time. Our average power was represented in terms of the voltage and current magnitudes as V sub M times I sub M over 2 times the cosine of the phase difference between the two of them. The average power could also be written in terms of RMS or effective values. Since the RMS values are 1 over root 2 times these maximum values, we can write this expression here as the effective voltage times the effective current times the cosine of the angle phase difference between the two. We also introduced the concept of complex power. To get complex power, we take the effective voltage as a phaser and the effective current as a phaser, except that we use its complex conjugate. Multiplying those two together gives us a complex power, which has a magnitude and a phase angle. This can also be written as the maximum voltage, or the voltage phaser representing the voltage, and the complex conjugate of the current phaser divided by 2. Complex power can also be written in rectangular form as capital P plus J times capital Q. Capital P is our average power from the previous slide, or the so-called real power. It is calculated as shown. Q is the reactive power. It's the imaginary part of the complex power. It is V effective times I effective times the sine of theta V minus theta I. S, P, and Q allow us to represent what's going on graphically in terms of a power triangle. S is the complex power. It has some real part, some imaginary part. It is at some phase angle, theta V minus theta I, from the real axis. The real part of S is P. Okay, so it's this amplitude times the cosine of this phase angle. And the imaginary part of S is Q, which is this magnitude times the sine of this phase angle. Now let's talk in a little bit more detail about power factor, which is abbreviated PF. The power factor was defined in the last lecture as the cosine of the difference between the voltage and the current phase angles. Now I also said in the last lecture that you want to remember that the voltage and the current are not entirely independent. They're related through the load. So if I have some voltage and some current provided to some load with a load impedance Z sub L, Z sub L is the ratio of the voltage phaser to the current phaser. The phase angle of Z sub L is the difference in the angles between the voltage and the current. It's this. So the angle of Z sub L is theta V minus theta I, so the power factor is actually directly related to the impedance of your load. That's important. Let's do a relatively quick example to refresh our memory about some of these concepts in the context of a circuit analysis. For this circuit, 
I want to determine the complex power delivered by the source and also the average power delivered by the source. Now, the way I'm going to approach doing the complex power is that I need the voltage and the current to get complex power. I can find the current from the voltage source if I know the equivalent impedance ZEQ of this overall circuit. So personally, my approach towards doing this problem is to, going to be to find an equivalent impedance here of this circuit, use that impedance to determine this current, use the current and the voltage to find the complex power. Once I've got the complex power, the average power is relatively easy. Now what I would like you to do is take a shot at doing this problem, go back and review some of the concepts from the last lecture if necessary, and then come back and watch me do the problem. Now in order to determine the complex power, S is equal to the voltage as a phasor times the complex conjugate of current as a phasor. So here I need to determine this current as a phasor take the complex conjugate, which means that I switch the sign on the imaginary part of this current, or equivalently, I change the sign on the phase angle, then I divide that by 2. To determine this current, what I'm going to do, as I mentioned previously, is get an equivalent impedance of this network. Then with this voltage phasor, this is going to be 5 at an angle of 0 degrees, and this equivalent impedance, I can determine the current. ZEQ. I need to transform this circuit into the frequency domain. The 2 ohm resistor has a 2 ohm impedance. This is 1 eighth of a farad. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over j omega times c, which is 1 over 4 times 1 eighth, which is going to be minus j2 ohms. The impedance of this inductor is j omega times l, which is going to be j times 0.5 times 4, which is j2 ohms. Now my equivalent impedance is this impedance, J2 ohms, plus this parallel combination, which is the product of the two impedances divided by the sum of the two impedances. So this becomes a minus J4, 2 times minus J2 over 2 minus J2. Since I'm going to be doing some addition, I think I'll go ahead and do this division in rectangular coordinates. So I'll ch multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate, 2 plus J2 over 2 plus J2. This becomes J2 plus 8 minus J8 over, this becomes 4 two times 2 is 8, so this becomes J2 plus 1 minus j, which is 1 plus j. Now I can use this impedance to get this current. So ZEQ is 1 plus j. I as a phasor is the voltage as a phasor, which is 5 at an angle of 0 degrees over 1 plus j, which is square root of 2 at an angle of 45 degrees. which is 5 over square root of 2 at an angle of minus 45 degrees. This is my current. The complex conjugate of this is the same amplitude, but I change the sign on the phase angle. Therefore, my complex power becomes 5 at an angle of 0 degrees, times my complex conjugate of current, which is 5 over square root of 2 at an angle of 45 degrees, over 2. So this becomes 25 over root 2 divided by 2 is 25 over 2 times the square root of 2. 0 plus 45 is 45 degrees. That's my complex power. Now we want to determine the average power delivered by the source. This is our overall circuit. Last time we converted the voltage source to phasor form and we determined the current phasor. Now we can determine the average power a couple of different ways. Now one possible way is to note that there is only one resistor in this. 
the average power is going to be dissipated by this resistor. I could take this current in here, use a current divider to de determine the current going into this resistor, and then do I squared times the resistance. That's kind of tedious since we've already gone to the trouble of determining the complex power. We said that S was equal to 25 over 2 times the square root of 2 at an angle of 45 degrees. In a power triangle form, real imaginary, this gives me S. It's at an angle of 45 degrees, and it has a length of 25 over 2 times the square root of 2. P is just the projection of S onto the real axis. So P is equal to 25 over 2 times the square root of 2 times the cosine of 45 degrees, which turns out to be 6.25 watts. Now one trick. If you want to, say you're given this problem on an exam, and you're asked to determine the power dissipated by the resistor. Like I said, you can determine the current. You can use a current divider. You can use this current to find the power dissipated by the resistor. Or you can notice that the average power has to be dissipated by this resistor. It's the only real valued impedance in this circuit. So the average power is going to be the real part of the complex power, which is relatively easy to determine. So you can take this, just determine the real part of it, you're done. Now I mentioned during the introduction that I wanted to talk some more about power factor, PF, and its effect on power delivery. Why is that factor so important to us? Turns out that if theta V and th minus theta I is not equal to zero, we have some reactive power that's not consumed by the load. Okay, you're sending this power to the load, but the load is just sending it back to you. You're trading it back and forth. It's not getting used to do any useful work. Now that doesn't seem like a big problem, but that means that your current provided to the load is higher than necessary because you're sending stuff back and forth that's not getting used. Now if you look at the way power is delivered, you have some generator generating a voltage, you have some current, and you have a load here that's, say, trading power back and forth to you. They're just taking it and then they're giving it back, so you can't really charge them for it. But what happens is that this reactive power that gets sent to the, to the load is actually causing some losses because you have resistances in your line that's connecting your generator to the load. So you're sending power to them that they're not using. They're sending it back to you. It's getting consumed in this line resistance. So you're generating power that you have to pay to generate, but nobody's paying you to give it to them. Power companies don't like to do that. They like to get paid for everything that they generate. So if you're a large power user, for example, a factory, the power company may impose a requirement on you that your load maintain some minimum power factor. For example, they may say you need to have a power factor greater than 0.9. Otherwise, we're wasting money sending you power. Okay, so they'll either charge you more for the power that they're sending to you, or they'll stop sending you power entirely. Most large loads, again, we're talking about factory type of environments, are inductive in nature. For example, inductive motors that are often used to spin stuff are called inductive motors because they're inductive in nature. That means that you will typically have a lagging power factor because of these inductive motors. You may need to correct that. If it's too small of a power factor, you must change your load so that the power factor becomes smaller. This process is called power factor correction. Now, I can't actually go in and redesign or use a different type of motor just to satisfy the power company, so I have to do something that's relatively inexpensive and I can implement it simply.
can't redesign my entire factory in order to create this power factor that the power company wants. If you have an inductive load, that means your power factor will be lagging. You can add a capacitor in parallel with the inductive load to increase the power factor. It will have an effect of putting a leading factor onto your existing lagging factor and try to bring that power factor back towards one. Now let's take a look at our power factor correction again in maybe slightly more physical terms. I have some load Z sub L, which is inductive in nature, and it has some power factor cosine theta 1. That means if I'm supplying voltage and current to the load, the phase difference between the voltage and the current is just theta 1. So theta 1 is theta V minus theta I. Now, if I look at a power triangle for this situation, I have some effective power, S1, that's resulting in some real or average power P being delivered. P is the projection of S1 onto the real axis. So if my angle, theta1, between the voltage and the current is relatively high, I get very little real power out of this. Now what I want to do is improve my power factor. I want to increase cosine theta1. That means I may have to decrease theta. I can do that by connecting a capacitor in parallel with this load. That capacitor will have a reactive power which is negative, QC down in this direction. These add in a vector form. So my new S2 here is going to be here at Q1 minus QC as its imaginary part. I can bring this guy down without changing this length, and that will result in changing this theta, which will increase my power factor. Remember, we don't want to change the length of this vector P. Okay? The power company wants you to have the amount of power that you need to have. They just don't want to waste a lot sending it to you. Let's take a look at this again on the next slide. Now, as I outlined on the previous slide, we can increase our power factor by applying a capacitor in parallel with our inductive load. So the effect of this capacitance is in to introduce a reactive power component that's essentially out of phase with this reactive power component so that they kind of cancel out. So our power triangle becomes this. S1 was our original complex power without this capacitor here. Introducing the capacitor introduced a reactive power associated with the capacitor, which is negative. So this S1 has decreased by an amount Q sub C, and now our corrected complex power is S2. It's got a smaller phase angle from the real axis, theta 2, and therefore a higher power factor. You aren't expending as much reactive power getting the power that you want to the load. Now let's do an example of a power factor correction. We have a circuit here. There is an inductive load. We have an inductor in parallel with a resistor, which is driven by some voltage source V sub S. V sub S is 100 cosine 377T. So in the phasor domain, V sub S is 100 in an angle of 0 degrees. Now, I want to find the power factor for this circuit. And then I want to redesign the circuit so that the power factor is exactly 1. Now, power factor only relies upon knowing the phase difference between the voltage and the current. So to get the power factor, you just need to determine the current going into this inductive load. That should be relatively easy for you to do. So give part A a shot before you come back and watch me do it. I'll then go ahead and do part B, which will typically be new to you at this stage. The first step in this example is to determine the power factor of the existing circuit. My voltage source, represented as a phasor, was 100 at an angle of 0 degrees.
I can represent this circuit in frequency domain form. By impedances, the resistor has a 100 ohm impedance. The inductor has a 1 Henry inductance. So the impedance is J times 1 Henry times omega. Omega was 377 radians per second, so this has an impedance of J 377 ohms. Now that I've converted this into the frequency domain, I can obtain the current as a phasor out of this source. The difference between the phase angle of the voltage and the phase angle of the current will give me the power factor. To me, it looks easiest to determine an equivalent impedance, ZEQ, seen by this source. Once I have equivalent impedance and the voltage, I can very easily calculate the current. The current and the voltage will give me the power factor. So ZEQ is equal to this parallel combination of impedances. I multiply the two impedances together, so 100 times J377 ohms over the sum of the impedances, 100 plus J377 ohms. If I do the complex arithmetic, this turns out to be 96.67 at an angle of 14.86 degrees. Now the current is just this voltage phasor over the equivalent impedance. So I sub S is equal to 100 at an angle of zero degrees, which is our voltage, divided by this impedance, 96.67 at an angle of 14.86 degrees. This turns out to be 1.03 at an angle of minus 14.86 degrees. So 1.03 is 100 over 96.67, minus 14.86 is zero minus 14.86. The power factor is the cosine of theta sub v minus theta sub i. So this is equal to the cosine of zero degrees, which is theta sub v minus a minus 14.86 degrees, which is theta sub i. So we have the cosine of positive 14.86 degrees, which is 0 0.967. Now, power factors are also characterized as being either leading or lagging, depending on the sign of this argument. Remember, the cosine function is symmetric. It doesn't change sign as this argument changes sign. So if this is positive, that means that the current is lagging the voltage. So this is 0 0.967 lagging as our power factor. Now let's take a look at redesigning the system in order to make the power factor be one. And I mentioned that to redesign the system to increase the power factor, we put a capacitance in parallel with the inductive load. So we have a capacitor here in parallel with our existing load. Our goal is to define what C is equal to. We need to design the size of this capacitor. Now before we have the capacitor, We need to find the Q of the load because we're going to use the capacitor to cancel out the reactive power from this inductive load. So Q sub L before the capacitor is V sub M I sub M over 2 sine of theta sub V minus theta sub I. On the previous slide, we calculated the voltage and the current phasors, so we have an amplitude of 100 on voltage, 1.03 on current, divided by 2, and this is the sine of 14.86 degrees. So it turns out that my existing reactive power is positive 13.26 VAR, volt amps reactive. So our capacitor is going to have to introduce a negative 13.26 volt amp reactive, reactive power in order to counteract that and create a power factor of 1. So we need the reactive power of the capacitor to be the negative of the reactive power of this inductive load. Q sub C is still V sub M, I sub M over 2, 
sine of theta v minus theta sub i. Now the voltage and current across a capacitor are 90 degrees out of phase. This becomes a negative 1. This becomes minus v sub m i sub m over 2, which is equal to the negative of the RMS or effective voltage times the RMS or effective current. Now the current is just the voltage divided by the magnitude of the capacitor's impedance. So Q sub C is equal to minus V effective squared over the magnitude of the capacitor's impedance. Remember I E F F is equal to V effective over the magnitude of the capacitor's impedance. The capacitor's impedance magnitude wise is 1 over omega C. This becomes a minus V effective squared times a 1 over omega C. Remember it's a magnitude, it doesn't have the J in it. This becomes a minus omega C V effective squared. That's what I want my QC to be. We wanted QC to be the negative of Q sub L, so this guy should be negative 13.26 VARs. So negative omega C V effective squared has to be equal to negative 13.26. Those signs cancel. C is equal to 13.26 over omega times V effective squared, which is 13.26 over omega was 377. The effective voltage is 100 over square root of 2. It's a pure sinusoid. I square that. That gives me a capacitance of 7 microfarads. So if we put this 7 microfarad capacitor across this load, we should correct our power factor so that it is exactly 1. This concludes lecture 32. It's also the end of our brief overview of AC power analysis. So we're done with any new material that's going to be presented in this course. We are going to give one more lecture which provides an overview of all the material that we've gone through. We've covered a lot of ground in not much depth, but we've covered a lot of, a lot of different topics. Take those topics, try to put them into some kind of framework as far as how they fit into an overall circuits modeling kind of philosophy.